Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you for who you are, God. We thank you for what you're about to do tonight, God. And we ask, Lord, that you would have your way, God. Lord, we ask that we would hear from you, God, that you would make it plain, that you would make it transparent, God. And Lord, that you are tonight, God, piercing to the very core of our being, God. We ask, Lord, that your name will be lifted up, God, and that we would not just be hearers, but that we will be doers of your word, God, in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you. We praise you and we give you glory. And God, we pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. amen and amen. Can we give it up for Jesus Christ? Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. And so whose clothes are you wearing? All of us in this place were raised up with parents, right? And at a certain point at our time when we were knowledgeable to know what in the world we were actually wearing, some of us had an issue with what our parents put on us. Amen. Some of us, my parents just put do some threw some stuff together, man, sent you out the door to school and you didn't even until so you started to realize it, like, man, I, I'm pretty jacked up, man. Like, what did my mom put on me? What kind of socks are these? You know what I mean? What shirt is this? I came, I was an 80s baby, man, and there was a lot of different things going on. Believe it or not, I actually had hair at one point, right? And my hair in the beginning, before it got cut, it was really straight. And so my hair would come off like a bow. You guys know what I'm talking about? It was like dumb and dumber. When the hair just kind of came down, it kind of went across type stuff. You know what I mean? I was literally like that. And I remember a time, believe it or not, man, I remember this time I was a little lad, man. And I was going on the bus. And I don't know what my mama had me wearing, but the bus driver thought I was a girl. You know, I go a man and it's like, oh, man, your daughter's so cute. It was just like, you know what I mean? It was like. That part of the movie that was like, dun, 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 and it's like, I'm about to jump off a cliff now. Like, it was this bogus because of how she had me dressed, how she had me looking, things like that, you know? And so all of us had, you know, those times. I remember there was a time last week where we had a young man come in and he did not like his jeans. He did not like his jeans at all, man. I mean, to the point he was sitting by himself, he was trying to avoid people, things like that. And then when they got home, he told his daddy, daddy took those jeans and threw them in the garbage. Amen. And so that's why when it comes down to whose clothes are you wearing, clothes really say a lot about an individual. See, a lot of us, when it comes down to clothes, we wear things on the how we feel on the inside. You see, if I want people to know that I'm a business person, what kind of clothes am I going to be wearing? A suit, tie. You know what I mean? Things like that, right? Depending on what kind of business person you are. If I want other people to know, like, hey, man, you know, I'm, I'm businessy, but I'm conservative at the same time. You know, you, what kind of clothes are you going to wear then? You were something that kind of dressed down a little bit, nice little polo or something, you know, some dress shoes look good or whatever. You might put some decent slacks on or you might put a sweater over that polo, you know? And then when people look at you, okay, man, you got a little conservative dude right here. You know what I mean? You got some polo on and stuff like that. And so it just goes on and on from there. Amen. Now, there's another side of this, this spectrum as well. And it's like when it comes down to clothes, even on a negative side, you think about prostitutes and stuff like that, right? In the Bible, they talked about prostitutes. And so prostitutes, when they are prostitutes, they were, they were very provocative clothes. How many know what I'm talking about, right? You know, somebody, I don't want to raise your hands because you want to be affiliated with that kind of stuff. But nevertheless, we all have seen it. We ought to be aware of it and we all know, okay, hey, that is X, Y, and Z. That is a, you know, a street walk, whatever you want to call it. You know what I mean? That is that. Just like, you know, a dancer and all these other things, you know what a ballerina looks like because a ballerina has ballerina clothes on. You know what a clown looks like because a clown has cl a clown clothes on. And the list can go on and on and on. The objective here is to understand the fact that clothes really do have a significance upon our identity because it is through fashion, that's the fashion is really big in our culture and our society, it is through fashion that a lot of people identity, identify themselves with. Some people kind of go too far, but that's on them, right? They paint their hair, you know, they have hair like green and, you know, yellow, or they go rainbowish. you know, like 6'9 like is when all out and started that trend, rainbow color and stuff like that. And it just goes on and on from there. You got some guys wearing wearing girl clothes. You got girls wearing guy clothes because it's all trying to depict the very identity and the person that is on the inside. Amen. And so all these things, for whether, whether it be from a professional field or even on the other side of the spectrum as a prostitute, things like that. Listen, 
Many of the most poisonous creatures can be identified based on the colors of their skin as well. Well, I, as you guys know, I love watching the, uh, you know Animal Kingdom type stuff on YouTube and things like that. You know, animals get eaten alive and all this other stuff about animals, right? But one thing I come to learn about animals that even though they don't dress fashionably like us, you know, they have their scales, they have their skin, they have their fur, whatever it is. But you can differentiate between what is poisonous and what is not a lot of times based upon what they have on. If you're in the ocean and you're swimming and you're diving and you're doing things like that, you're going to recognize certain fish based upon their color and the way they are on the outside that that is a poisonous fish. You go around poisonous snakes, you're going to realize that this snake with this kind of color is poisonous. That goes all the way down to like the little lizards and things like that, even frogs. Based upon the color of their skin, you will be able to tell this is a poisonous animal. Amen? And so I want us to, to be able to gauge a picture across the, you know, across our, our, our planet, across our world, that when it comes down to clothes, you can realize a lot of things. Last week we talked about putting off some of these clothes, putting off sexual immorality, putting it to death, putting off anger and rage and all these other things. We talked about these specific garments that, that, that Paul was saying, commanding us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you must rid yourself. You must take off all these things that you used to wear in your old life. Amen? And so our outer garments reflect our inner allegiance. I want to say that again. Our outer garments reflect our inner allegiance. Amen? And so, as we talked about, we have to put to death and put off everything that reflects our earthly nature and our allegiance to the old self and lives that our relationship with God and people may reflect the new self that has and is being renewed in the image of his creator. We need to put off the old man, burn those clothes, rid ourselves of those things that reflect everything as far as our old life, our earthly nature, our fleshly nature. Whether it be sex outside of marriage, whether it be anger and rage and, you know, reflecting our relationship with God and with people. Listen, you can be able to tell who's a sexually immoral person, who's a lustful person, who's lying, who's cheating, who has anger, who has rage. And all the list that we've been talking about for the last two weeks based upon what they put on that day. If they put on and woke up with anger and they put on anger, and I'm not talking about a righteous anger, but a earthly anger or a selfish anger. If they put that clothing on that morning, guess what? By the afternoon time, you can see that they have transitioned and changed clothes and now they're operating in rage. And now they're just yelling at everybody. So you can tell what happens when an individual puts these things on because they will begin to act out the very thing they have put on them. And in this case, anger, rage, and so on and so forth. And the Bible is talking about we must put those things off. Amen? We have to put them off. And so the Bible, and in the last week's uh, uh, text, we talked about that we are constantly being renewed in the image of our Creator through the knowledge we gain as we get to know God Himself. We are being renewed. We're being changed. We're being transformed. Amen? The old clothes we used to wear were tailored by the devil himself. I need to us I need us to explain what is happening tonight to have a better understanding before we get into the body of our message. We need to understand what is the difference between old clothes and new clothes and what is Paul trying to talk about and getting into when it comes down to the scriptures that we're about to jump into. And we have to understand that this old nature, that the old clothes we used to put on, because he uses clothes as a metaphor, because it's just like that. It's putting on something. When we put on the old clothes, believe it or not, the one who tailored those very clothes were tailored by the devil, tailored by Satan. He knew your measurements. He knew your widths. He knew your height. He knew your size. He knew exactly what kind of dose to put on you. He knew exactly what kind of shoes for us to have in so we can continue to walk in sin. He knows us just like that. He knows what size shoe you wear. He knows what size hat you wear that will cover your mind. He knows exactly what you like to eat, what you like to wear, all these other things. You were tailored and we were tailored in those clothes. And so we have to understand Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They were walking with Jesus Christ, right? 
They had a relationship with the Lord. They were walking with God in the Garden of Eden, and they were walking what? Did they have clothes on? No. They were walking naked, and the Bible says they had no shame. They're walking, man, just chilling. They didn't even care about, he looking at his wife, you know what I mean? She probably was super hot, right? The first woman on earth, you could imagine, like, she was ready, you know what I mean? The first dude on earth, this dude probably didn't have to work out. It was just all natural, just bam, like, what's up? Little oh, shoot, I'm ready, you know what I mean? So they're perfect in that sense, right? They're walking around naked, though, no clothes on. But the moment they chose to eat that fruit, the wife, and then the wife says, he, the Bible says they pass it to her husband. It was at that moment that their eyes were open and they realized that they were naked. The very clothes to which God had clothed them with were no longer good enough. And when they did that, they went out and, and uh, created and made their own clothes that covered them and covered their, their parts and other private parts and things like that. But listen, though, the moment that they allowed sin to come into the world, you began to notice that their fashion began to change. They were no longer fashioned and then putting on the clothes and the wardrobe that God had given them. They began to put on the clothes that Satan, the devil, the deceiver gave to them to put on. A little bit after that, that one act of disobedience, you began to see the story unfold of what happened to the human race. And it began to transition over to act out in the very clothes that the enemy was giving them. That it was not too long after that. Matter of fact, the next chapter in Genesis chapter four, that we see murder. And one of the brothers named Cain put on the suit of murder. He put on the jacket of murder and he went and killed his brother. How did it get that far? Because they began to wear clothes that were tailored by the enemy rather than God himself. Amen. And so I want us to be able to just kind of put that picture in our head when it comes down to the section where we're, we're about to get into is whose clothes are you wearing? Amen. Whose clothes are you wearing? The Bible says in, in Colossians chapter three, verse 12 and 14, therefore, as God's chosen people, Holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, gentleness, I'm sorry, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Amen. I'm sure some of us are, are aware of those particular of those particular verses and what God is calling us to do. They're very similar to the, 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 the things that the spirit of God gives us. Amen. The fruits of the spirit of God, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, and you know, so on and so forth. They're very similar to that. So we know that he's no longer talking about putting off some things here. He's now talking about putting on some things. And so we've been, we've been hearing for the last two weeks to put to death and to put off certain clothes. But now we have come to the time where God was saying, now, listen, now that you're choosing to be a Christian, now that you're choosing to walk in my, you know, by my spirit, not by sight, you're choosing to set your mind and your heart on things above. If you are that Christian doing that, then listen, now is a time to put things on. See, it's not just one thing to take some things off in regards to our sinful nature, in regards to our old life. We have to now replace the fact that we were now naked because once you take some stuff off, you're now naked. So now God's not going to have you to run naked. No, now these things, when you leave your house every day, when you get up every day and you step out of the bed, you need to put on some things regardless of how you're feeling, regardless of what kind of sleep you have or what kind of dream you have. You need to put on the things that Jesus Christ is telling us to put on. Whose clothes are you wearing today? Some of us walked in, man, with clothes and the enemy tailored for you, and you're literally wearing hats that are only causing you anger and bitterness and unforgiveness and all these other things. And God literally commanded you to say, take those things off. But because you allow the flesh and the enemy to deceive us, we put the hat on and we wear it proudly. Some of y'all taking off your hats, but it's okay. You know what I mean? We're talking about spiritually speaking here, right? And so what kind of clothes or whose clothes are you wearing today? This word, therefore, as we see on the screen and as we've been learning for that, the things that are above it is therefore. So now he's about to get into some things or some commandments to which we should add to our life. He says, therefore, 
right? As God's chosen people. So since we are commanded to put to death and rid ourselves of everything that affects our vertical and horizontal relationship with God and his people by taking off the old self and putting on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge of the image of his creator, Jesus, who removed all barriers and created bridges from old us to new us. And by him, we must do the following. We have to understand, as we talked about and closed out last week, that there's no longer slave nor free. There's no longer Gentile nor Jew, barbarian or Scythian. There's no longer, you know, a circumcised or uncircumcised. There's no longer none of these things. It says that Christ is in all and, and uh, he is all and in all. Meaning, listen, Christ is the one who literally created the bridge from our old self to our new self, that we no longer operate on this side of the fence or this side of the bridge no longer. He has made the bridge to cross the other side that we can now act like Jesus every single day. And so how do we do those things? How do, how do we operate? How does that look like to be a Christian in our day and age? It looks like just like they used to do back in the days. The Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever shall be. So these very things, the very clothing to which we're going to talk about today is the clothing that they used back in the days and the same clothing that would dictate a man of God and a woman of God today all the way into eternity. Amen. And so whose clothes do you have on? Therefore, reason we must do the following. He begins to give us a reason. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. As God's chosen people, Colossians 3.10 says, and have put on the what self? The new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its, the new self's creator. That's what he's telling us to do as God's chosen people and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. You are no longer just any people. You are now the people of God. He says and uses therefore and then goes off into the reasons why we ought to do the following, which is going to come afterwards, as God's chosen people. The question I have for you, are you God's chosen people? Have you become a child of the living God? Because if that's you, listen, it's not based upon whether you were a Gentile or Jew. It's not based upon whether you were educated or uneducated. It's not based upon whether you used to be a slave and now you are free. It's not based upon none of these things. If you're a barbarian or a Scythian, if you were just living just wild and crazy or you're just calm and collected, it don't make a difference. Listen, it is about Jesus Christ who literally created the bridge from old self to new self, from slave to now free and all the other things in between. Jesus Christ did it so that we can now call ourselves children of the most high God. Come on, I got one girl clapping, a little one. She understands what's going on here, amen? It is huge because there was a time to which, and even sometime this week, some of us assumed and thought that we were not children of the most high God. And we based this thing literally upon the thoughts that we were having, the way we were feeling, or based upon the past and all the things that we have done. And we say, man, I cannot possibly be a child of God. See, it's important to understand the therefore part of this as God's chosen people that, listen, you did not choose God. God chose you. And because he chose you, that means that you had nothing to do with it in regards to works, in regards to keeping some set of rules and regulations, in regards to coming to church or praying a whole lot. None of those things. God says, listen, you are now my chosen people. And I chose you in mercy, in grace. And loving kindness. See, some of us here, including myself, man, if it was based upon me, I would not be a child of God. Because I'm just not good enough. Many people know what I'm talking about. We're just not good enough. We try to be good enough, man. We try to just say all the right words, but sometimes we get so mad that we just say the wrong words. We try to follow God's commands so much, but every time I try harder, I tend to break them even more. We try this, we try that, we try to do the Nike thing and just do it. And listen, none of it works. But the moment we realize that therefore, because God has chosen me, there's a weight that lifts off of us when you truly put your faith in Jesus Christ. Because he is the one who made us the people of God, the God's chosen 
people. Amen? The next thing he said was holy and dearly loved. Holy means sacrifice, uh, sanctified, set apart for his good purpose. And then it says dearly loved. Not just loved a little bit. No, he says you are dearly loved. Why does Paul start with this? Why does he get into these kind of things as far as God's chosen people and holy and dearly loved? Why does he have to remind the Colossians about these things? Why does the word of God have to remind us about these things? It's for us to understand that it's not about us. It's about Jesus. It's about him and his finished work on the cross. See, some of us will get so discouraged at the first fact that we're God's chosen people and assume that we're not God's chosen people. And if so, if I don't feel like I'm God's chosen people, why should I live holy? Why should I even feel like God loves me, let alone dearly loves me? You see, many of us go through a lot of things every single day, up and down, round and round, a lot of temptation, a lot of pressures from the left to the right, everything else, disputes with the spouse or, you know, having issues with the kids, issues at work and things like that. And by the time of the end of the day, if our minds and our hearts are not stayed on Jesus Christ, we will begin to ask ourselves, am I really God's chosen person? Am I really? You see, you got to ask, you got to answer for yourself according to God's word, this first one. Because if you don't believe that you're God's chosen people, guess what? Holy, dearly loved, you care less about that. You see, if I'm not a child of God, then I don't have to live up to the standards of a child of God. It wouldn't mean nothing to me. I can just go back and start wearing my old clothes, go back to the hood, game bang, do things like that. Because listen, it don't make a difference. I'm just not good enough. Any of us inside his house ever felt like I'm just not good enough? I'm just not good enough for my wife. I'm just not good enough for my friends. I'm just not good enough for Jesus. And literally, when we begin to speak and stand on words like that, that is the initiator that literally opens up the door to the old life and we run out the back door because we're just not good enough. We're just not good enough. But according to God's word, right? Who are you? You're God's chosen people. So therefore, you ought to be what now? God's holy. chosen people. Thank you. Holy and dearly loved. God loves you. Daughter of the king. Son of the living God. The Bible says he dearly loves you. You may not feel loved today because you might have sinned before you came into church. You may not feel loved today because you might have sinned this week sometime. You might not have felt love or feel love today because your own old nature is standing in between you and the love of God. And listen, the Bible talks about God's love, that it covers a multitude of sin, real, genuine love, cast out fear. And I need to tell you that tonight that God dearly loves you. God loves you. Oh, but I did X, Y, and Z. Listen, God still loves you. Oh, man, but you don't understand, God. I, you don't understand, Steve. Like, I really messed up. Listen, God still loves you. The word of God says nothing can separate us from the love of God. Listen, nor death, nor life, nor height, nor depth, no angel or demon, no nothing can separate you from the love of God but you. See, the only one that can separate you from the love of God is you. Because you continually, literally, and just throw away or push away the love of God because you don't understand it, because you think it's conditional, and you think it's based upon your good marriage and the way you live your life. And listen, God does not draw off that, but he would not forcefully love you. He would still love you nonetheless, but listen, he can't force you to accept his love. You still have a free will. But if you can but get the understanding within our brains and within the soul of our being that I am dearly loved by God, watch what begins to happen to your very minds and your very eyes and your very heart. It begins to change based on the love of God. Some of us just need to let God hug you, love you, just talk to you, just be in his presence and let him love on you. We just want to do drive-bys because we think God's going to expose us in his presence to such a degree that we're going to leave his presence in shame. No. You will leave his presence with confirmation that in spite of my God loves me. He loves me so much to not leave me in my mess, but to take me out of my mess and transform me. Amen? Somebody give it up for Jesus Christ for that. Praise the name of God. Amen? 
Listen, a Christ-centered life is a life that knows who you are because of whose you are and is identified by and through this assurance. To having a Christ-like, a Christ-like life or Christ-centered life, we have to know that we are God's chosen people, number one. And number two, we have to know that God has called us to be sanctified and has a purpose for our life. And number three, that we're dearly loved by God. Is that what does those three things not the things in which we're looking for? Am I really saved? Am I really a child of God? The Bible says, yes, you are. If you have put your faith in the servants in Jesus Christ, repented and just gave your life to Jesus, you are a child of God, number one. Number two, he has set you apart. Sometimes we look at the word holy and we get scared of it because that means that we got to be perfect and all those other things. Listen, holy means set apart, meaning he has given you your life meaning now. You are not just an idle individual or an idle human being. You are a human being with purpose. You are a human being with destiny. And that is in God's hands. And lastly, that he loves us. Amen? Praise God. I don't know about you guys, but I want a Christ-centered life that literally is built upon the very love and, 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 and choice that Jesus Christ made for me. The fact that he has given me a life that he has set apart and gave it purpose and destiny. Amen? That comes from Jesus Christ. That is the life I want based upon the assurance of the word of God. And so next, Paul gets into the clothe yourselves with. Somebody said clothe yourselves with. The very first one that Paul gets into in this one is compassion. Compassion. Like this. So listen to this. Actions of a Christian who is chosen by God, set apart by God, and dearly loved by God will do the following in God, and they will clothe themselves with compassion. What is compassion, see? It's sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with a desire to alleviate it. You guys understand that? Let me see if I... Yeah. Sympathetic consciousness of others' distress together with a desire to alleviate it. Not just leave it there in this person, but listen, I have a desire to carry your burdens. I have a desire to be in your life and to care about you so much that I want to help you alleviate these issues that are going on within your life. If I had a, some clothes, I was going to wear some clothes today or bring a suit and kind of like kind of hide it right here, whatever, and kind of go in, dress, and then pop back out like, yo, you know, whatever. But my wife was like, nah, you're doing too much. So I said, okay, maybe you're right. I'm not going to do that. But listen, if I can give you guys a picture here, right? Compassion will be the very first thing to what you put on, right? It will be the shirt, the button-up shirt that you would put on. And so as you get up every single day, you want to put on as a button-up shirt, compassion with the ability to be sympathetic or consciously sympathetic of others' distress together with a desire to alleviate it. The Bible says in Philippians 2, 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Man, if we just jump on this verse right here, do you know how many marriages will be on top of the game? If we put, put listen, put others' value over our own. Do you understand that as a Christian, as a Christian uh, house, as a Christian body, we can change the ratio? Between divorce and marriage, we can literally change that percentage, which is, I believe is the same in the world as in the church. The percentage of the divorce rate is so out of order, so disorderly, just the, the conduct of it is horrible. But listen, we can change that percentage if, if some of us would just put on this, the clothes, the shirt of compassion and button that thing up every single day. That when we walk on our day-to-day -day missions every single day, whether it be in a household, whether it be at work, whether it be wherever it's at, Walmart, the zoo, it don't make a difference. If we had compassion on us, lives will be changed, man. Listen, a whole nation will be changed. If we will put on compassion. Paul is saying, listen, the very first thing that I need you to do, child of God, woman of God, uh, 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 son of God, the very first thing I need you to do is put on compassion. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. It's saying that we must walk around every single day. We already put off the old man, so now we're putting on the new man. And the first thing that we need to literally put on ourselves is put on compassion to begin to think about others more than yourselves. 
See, some of us don't want to hear that in church today because we have put self first before everybody else and their moms, including our husbands and everybody else. And when we talk about compassion, that's almost like a bad word for us. Like, what? I got to think about others' interests more than my own? You done lost your ever-loving mind. Who told you this? It's in the Bible, man. Jesus is talking about this. But for so many, it just seems so foreign to them because we have allowed ourselves to operate in the old man and still call ourselves Christian. We still call ourselves Christian even though we have not put on the shirt of compassion. And so we want to put ourselves above others rather than put others above ourselves. Verse 4 says, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Did you guys see why this shirt is so important? How are you supposed to put on the rest of the gear that, that God has given us, the rest of the wardrobe that God has given us on a day-to-day -day basis if we first can't even be compassion, compassionate to other people? Jesus Christ said, I have come to serve rather than to be served. I come to think about somebody else's interest like the whole world and die for them so that they can live. That's compassion. Amen? The next one he talks about Clothe yourselves with kindness. That's the tie, if you will, right? A man knows what I'm talking about, right? I can't talk about the female not putting on any skirts today. This ain't that, right? But listen, kindness. You put the shirt on after that, you put the tie on. Tie, the tie of kindness is the thing that people ought to be able to see amongst them. They ought to see the shirt and begin to look at you like, okay, you are a human being. I remember you from back in the days. But something just looks different. Kind of shirt you have on, and it's like, oh, you you talking about this shirt right here? Oh man, yeah, man, who made that shirt, dude? Oh, oh man, this, man, my God made this shirt for real. Yeah, dude, well, what's it called? Well, it's called compassion. And he's looking at you like, I understand that. It. It's trippy how you just put everybody else before you. When it comes down to the job, instead of you stepping on people and going from there, you put other people before you. And I see that different about you. What about that tie, man? What fashion is that tie, man? What, 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 what's that right there? Oh, this tie right here, this little thing right here? Oh, this tie, man, is made by my God as well. For real, man, what is it called? Well, it's a tie of kindness. It's a kindness tie. That's the name of this thing. And so you see how I put it on here, man. It wraps around my neck. It covers my chest up right here. It goes down here. Everybody can see it. They're looking at the tie because they're noticing that something is different about this individual because the tie just is something about this tie, man. It's not like something out of this world. It's, it's, I mean, it's something out of this world. It's not of this nature. It's not of this earth. No, it's not because it comes from God. And it's called kindness, affectionate. A feeling of liking and caring for someone or something else. You see, when we're walking around on our day-to-day -day business, right, people ought to be able to see the tie to which we have around our necks. They should be able to feel a certain kindness that comes from us. Because we are no longer part of the old man. We are now part of a new man, a new humanity that's been created in the image and likeness of Jesus Christ himself. Ephesians 2, 7 says, and he did this so that in the ages to come, he might clearly show the immeasurable and unsurpassed riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus by providing for our redemption. Could you or could we pay for our redemption? We can't. But you know what the kindness of God did? It thought about us. It was the affection of God. It was the feeling of liking and caring for his people that he came to this earth. And he says, I'm going to die so I can redeem you. So I can bring you back to God. So I can cleanse you of your sins and your iniquities. Kindness begins to walk around in it and it thinks about others' people, even though they don't deserve it, even though they may even think they don't deserve it. But we still have a feeling of liking and caring for them in spite of what they think or how they portray themselves because we have a tie and it's called kindness. It's liking and caring for someone else, just like Jesus liked and cared for us to the point that he died for us. Amen. Somebody say, clothe yourself. Close yourself. Thank you. Number three is humility. 
If, you, if humility was anything, it was a jacket. It was the very jacket to what we put on. The Bible says, clothe yourselves with humility. It is literally to put it on your body and let it cover you to such a degree. Back in the days, they didn't have ties and like suits and jackets and stuff like that. They just put on, I don't even know what it's called, but it's like a robe. You guys know what I'm talking about? Back in the days, we see movies, old movies or whatever. But it was like putting on a robe. It covered you. And the Bible is saying, listen, I need you to hold yourselves with humility now. In place of pride, in place of egotistic, you know, being egotistic, in place of all these arrogance and things like that. Instead of being like the old man, I want you to put on new clothes that represents God himself in all humility. God is saying we must be humble, free from pride or arrogance, the quality or state of being humble. We need to put humility on as a jacket. Look at what Paul says right here. He clarifies this word humility. This is the King James Version. Acts 20 verse 19. Serving the Lord with all humility of what? Mind. And with many tears and temptations which befell me by the living, by the living, or sorry, lying in wait of the Jews. Ephesians 4 2 says with all humility forsaking self Righteousness. And so some of us may think that humility is, is something else other than a mindset. But listen, according to Acts chapter 20, verse 19, it says serving the Lord with all humility of what? Of mind. When we put on the jacket of humility, listen, it ought to be a mindset to which we're walking into. It ought to be some kind of consciousness there. It ought to be a literal decision to which we make on a day-to-day -day basis that I refuse to be arrogant. I refuse to be prideful. Instead, I want to have the quality or state of being humble at all times. And the Bible goes on to say in Ephesians 4, 2, with all humility, forsaking self-righteousness. It's lifting up and exalting the righteousness of God in our lives. We have to put on the jacket of humility. When we don't have the jacket of humility, we are unable to make an impact in our society, let alone in our world, because it's too busy being self-righteous rather than going out and exalting the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. We need to practice humility. The fourth one here, clothe yourselves. He goes on and says, put on gentleness. Clothing. Gentleness is to put on the pants. Amen. Putting on the pants. You got the shirt. You got the tie. You got the jacket. Now you're putting on the pants. Amen. And so people are looking at you on a day-to-day -day basis, man, and they're wondering, man, whose man's is this? Who is this? Who is this, this girl right here? Who is this dude right here? Why are they different? Why are they so happy, man, when it comes down to, I see them on the bus and public transportation. Everybody else is so frustrated because they're so packed up in there. But you look at this person, and they have a glow to themselves. They're so gentle at heart. It's like they wear it as their pants. Just gentle all the time. Gentleness going before them. Listen, it says free from harshness, sternness, or violence. Mildness of disposition. You're not carrying around just being rough on people, talking nonsense to people, trying to force people to hear the gospel. No, it's just gentle with it. You're not putting your own agenda first. You're putting God first. Gentleness of spirit. Meekness. Gentleness or meekness in the opposite of self-assertiveness and self-interest. It stems from trust in God's goodness and control over the situation. See, some of us, man, because we desire control, because we cannot handle being out of control, when things start being chaotic within our lives, the bills, you know, the money's not coming in right, the bills are stacking up, all these other things are happening, we begin to lose control. And when we lose control, instead of going to the one who is all control, we lose all gentleness and lose control in ourselves. We begin to act crazy. We get an attitude. How many people know when you lose control how you act? 
When you feel like, man, I have no, I don't have the answer to the situation. I don't know how we're going to get through for the next month. I don't know what's going on, man. I'm tired of this stuff. And all of a sudden, man, you start gaining the anger again, the rage, the slander, and all the things of the old man. See, there's something about clothes in our wardrobe right now. I'm pretty sure people have clothes in their wardrobe from like five years ago. Right? Probably even longer than that. Man, I haven't had this shirt, man, for about a good 10 years. I just take care of it. You know what I mean? You still have those clothes of the old man. Listen, they're still hung up in our closet somewhere. Just ask, waiting for that right day for you to come in and be like, you know what? I'm so tired of this stuff. Skip all this nonsense. Give me that shirt right there that says anger. Yep, let me get that slander right here. I'm going straight to Facebook right now. It's going down. Yep, let me get that hat right there of unforgiveness. Put that thing on too. I'm tired of this stuff. And then we go to Facebook. I'm tired of this stuff. You're going to hear what I got to say. That's it. Oh, you're on your phone or whatever, cracked and everything, fingers start bleeding and stuff like that, and you're still typing away. So tired of this first day, you're going to take this right here. Tired of stupid people saying stupid things at stupid times. Like something like that. And then you just, bam, post. And you're just waiting. You're just waiting for somebody, the right person to come across, come across that post because you know you did it for somebody. And listen, the whole time God is telling you, don't press post. Do not press that button, post. You better delete this message, walk away, and come holler at me. And what happens, we're like, no, man, God, today, I put my old clothes on. I got that anger shirt. I got the unforgiveness hat. Listen, I'm rocking that sucker, bro. I got my, you know what I mean? I got all, I got my pants on, man, that's slandering. You know what I mean? Look, I ain't got time today, Jesus. I'll holler at you on Sunday or Friday. But today, midweek, hump day, I ain't taking nothing from nobody today. Come across me the wrong way. It's going down. You guys know what I'm talking about. Somebody, I don't even want to look in my eyes. You're like, look, I think he's talking to me right now. I'm just going to keep my eyes closed down here, and maybe he'll just pass me up and keep preaching. Listen, let God speak to our hearts. Amen? We need to put on the new self and put off the old self. Amen? Whose clothes you have on today. And so the gentle person is not occupied with self at all. This is a work of the Holy Spirit, not of the human will. See, gentleness is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. And if we don't operate in gentleness, we would operate in the opposite of gentleness, being harsh and, and just cruel and violent to everybody else because we have lost control. You know, misery loves company type stuff. And it's like all of a sudden that you feel like you're all alone, but you'll call some people up so they can come over or whatever so they can be miserable with you. And all it does is fuel misery. You guys know what I'm talking about? That's exactly what this is, the opposite of this. So God is calling us to be gentle. Amen. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 2, and gentleness, maintaining self-control. Mind you, this is how this is how God wants us to dress in a world that is totally opposite of gentleness. And God is saying, no, listen, just because they're like that doesn't give you the right to be like that. I've called you to be gentle. And so it's maintaining self-control. It's being in a, in, a, in a conversation with somebody else and not allowing the way they are or the way they're talking to you to begin to lift you up in a negative way that you start thinking about yourself now. Oh, you ain't going to talk to me like that, homie. Oh, you're not going to do those things right there. And you may not say it yet because you're just trying to get your turn to, to speak back. And all of a sudden, your mind is not a mind of gentleness. Your mind is actually the mind that is ready to respond in a harsh and violent way. It's not from God. It's from the enemy. The Bible says we ought to be gentle and put on gentleness, maintaining self-control. Anybody need self-control today? Amen. Somebody say, clothe yourselves. Thank you, brother. Patience. Bearing pains or trials calmly or without complaints. Patience. Forbearance. Long-suffering. Slowness in avenging wrongs. Patience. You ever been trying to pray for patience and all of a sudden the test comes up? You're like, God, I need some more patience in my life. That's probably why some people don't even pray at all. So like, look, I'm not going to pray for patience, peace, or any of this stuff anymore because every time it happens, something happens after that. You guys ever wondered that stuff? You ever wonder why? It's because God, I've been there too. Listen, I've been there, man. But listen, the reason why the test comes is because that is the way God prunes you. He fires you. Some of us think that God is like like a little uh, 
what's that called? Like like a Tinkerbell or something, you know? And then he just flying around real cute and stuff, you know what I mean? Just strutting, you know, got nice hair and stuff, you know, Jesus hair flowing and stuff, got a nice beard going, and he got wings on the back with some fairy dust. And we begin to pray like, God, listen, I need patience. And then you think that God's like an automatic, like, okay, give this person patience. Sprinkle dust or whatever. And then all of a sudden you got patience. Man, it don't work like that. Jesus is not no, you know, a genie in a bottle like some Aladdin stuff. It don't work like that, man. God is a relational person. Yes, he will deliver you off some stuff. Yes, he will make some miracles. Yes, he will do these things. But listen, when it comes down to these virtues, when you pray, God, I need patience. God is like, listen, I've been waiting for you to pray for patience because you definitely need some patience. And guess what? Next week, I have created a whole test for you so you can gain patience the way I've called you to be patient. And then when next week comes, we're like, what is happening today? Why is my boss coming at me like this? What time of the month it is? And y'all start adding some stuff up or whatever the case may be. Y'all females, y'all know what I'm talking about, man. And they're like, you know what? I'm just going to call off today. I'm going home today. I don't, don't even pay me. I don't even care. I'm out this piece. You can keep that money. I'd rather keep my, my, my sanity rather than your money type stuff. But listen, though. God has created these things so that we can be patient. He is not going to fairy dust patience inside of you. He's going to say, okay. You want patience? I have set up an oven right here. I'm going to put you in the oven and I'm going to bake you for a little bit. But once that thing goes out, boom, you're going to have patience inside of you. And it ain't going to be no fairy dust patience. It's going to be a patience that you appreciate and continue to apply into your life every single day. See, if God was a fairy tale, just a genie in a bottle thing, boom, there it is. You have patience. Now, listen, we won't even appreciate that patience. Some of us are asking for all type of things in our marriages, in our family. And we're like, God, we need it done right now. Just right now. I don't need the oven, God. I don't need the fire, God. I don't need to draw a little bit. I just need it right now. And God's like, no, I don't work like that. Because if I will give it to you right now in an instant, in a, in a, in a snap of a finger, listen, you'll be giving that thing up by 5 o'clock tonight and it'll be done. Because you won't appreciate it because I just gave it to you like nothing. And so if I give it to you just like a genie, guess what? You're going to think that I can just come at God any other time. Hey, genie in the bottle, I need this now. Work that out right now. God don't work like that. See, he wants you to be genuine. He wants us to appreciate patience because we know how patient he has been with us. Oh, don't get me started talking about that. You see, we tend to forget how patient God is with us. And then when it comes down to be patient with one another, we don't want to be patient. But yet when we go back in our prayer closet that morning or that night or whatever, hey, God, thank you, Lord. God, you know, I done messed up again. I know you told me, man, to stop cursing, and I just curse all through the day. But listen, it wasn't my fault, though, God. There he came at me. He forgot the computer. He did all these other things, God, and I just had to let it out to him, you know? I had to just give it to him. He didn't really do this. Man. I'm just saying I got to pick on my brother, right? But listen, though, it's like, oh, man, you know what I mean? This, you know, yeah, it was their fault. You know, God, just help me. God, be patient with me, God. And then we get out of our prayer closet from patience, and then we walk to our spouses and just, whoop, whoop, uh, 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 tired of stuff, don't trust me, I'm playing video games. Modern Warfare just came out, leave me alone, that's it, it's done. And it was like, God is just looking at us like, did you forget how patient I have been with you for the last 27 years? You just got saved last week. Do you know how many bullets I had to hit for you? Do you know how many times I had to save you from getting hit by that car because you were so enraged and you just want to cross the street without looking left or right and that truck was coming? And so we have to remember, listen, all of these virtues in which God is telling us to be about, we have to keep in mind that these virtues are literally about God himself and they reflect his nature and how he treats us. And so therefore we ought to treat others like manner. Amen. Some of y'all are like, I don't want patience, man. You can keep going with that. Pastor, please keep preaching. I don't care about patience. We need patience. Because come next week, you're going to have no patience. Maybe you're going to hit somebody upside the head. They're going to fall. You're going to be locked up somewhere talking about, can you send me some commissary money or write me a letter? And I'm like, look, let me ask God if I got enough patience for this. Because I don't know. You know what I mean? But <laughs> listen, no patience. Amen? 2 Timothy 4.2 says, preach the word as an official messenger. Be ready when the time is right, and even when it is not. Keep your sense of urgency, whether the opportunity seems favorable or unfavorable, whether convenient or inconvenient, whether welcome or unwelcome. Correct those who err in doctrine or behavior. Warn those who sin. Exhort and encourage those who are growing toward spiritual maturity. 
with inexhaustible patience and faithful teaching. Patience doesn't mean that we don't stop messing with people, that we don't we stop correcting people. No, it means doing these things with a sense of patience within us. Amen. Being patient with other people's foolishness, being patient with other people's sins and issues and strongholds, just like God was patient with us. Number six, clothe yourselves. Somebody say, clothe yourselves with. Bear, forgive one another. The Bible says in verse 13, this is the only one that God begins, or the Bible begins to break down. It says, bear with each other and forgive one another. What does it say about one another? And what else? Forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, the Bible says, bear with them, man. You got a grievance, an issue with them? Listen, skip their issue, bear with them, and listen, forgive them. Does it say forgive when they come ask for forgiveness? Did it just say that? The scripture. No, it didn't. It don't say, listen, man, you forgive them when they come over and ask for forgiveness. Say, hey, you do that. But listen, you don't wait until they come and ask you for forgiveness. No, listen, you excuse it. You bear with them. And then you forgive them at the same time. Forgiveness and bearing with another are the same, uh, same coin, you know, the two sides of the same coin. You're bearing with each other. And the reason why you can help bear with these individuals is because you're already forgiven them for that which they're doing to you in response. So I'm able to help you and bear these issues with you. I'm able to stand alongside with you and carry you even though you're cursing me out, even though you're biting the hand that feeds you, even though you do all these other things. Why? Because I love you and I'm a child of God. So I bear with you and I forgive you of the grievances to what you have against me or me against you. I forgive you. The Bible says bear is to hold oneself up against, figuratively to put up with, bear with, endure, forbear, suffer with each other, and tolerate, listen to this, tolerate one another and forgive one another's grievances, forgiving as Christ forgave us. Listen to this, it's having the mind of Christ and remembering how God tolerates and forgives us so we should do so with, with each other. Amen? We ought to forgive the way Jesus Christ forgave us. Some of y'all might be saying, but pastor, man, you don't know what they did to me. You don't know how much they hurt me. You don't know the scars I have because of this individual. You don't realize, you don't understand, man. This stuff mess with my mind and mess with my life. It messes with my emotion, man. I dream about this stuff. This stuff hurt me. My response would be you to will be this. How much have we hurt Jesus? He took nails in his hands and feet. He took a cross. The Son of God came and was killed by his own creation. It's like your children putting you on a cross, nailing you up there, putting thorns on your head, whipping you, tearing off your beard, tearing off your hair, whatever it is, putting nails in your feet, putting you on this cross, and then looking at you and spitting on you at the same time. And you're looking down at them like, wait a minute, I gave birth to you. I created you. I held you for nine months in my stomach. That's what we did to Jesus. He created us in his own image and likeness. And then when he came to the world, the world did not recognize him. And we killed him, each and every one of us here. And yet and still, he was on that cross and looked down on his people. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they not know what they do. Forgive them, for they not know what they do. And having the mind of Christ and remembering how God tolerates and forgives us, so we should do so with each other. Forgive as Christ has forgiven you. Listen, that is the socks and shoes of this whole thing, this whole ensemble. Spiritually speaking, when we walk around with the suit in Christ Jesus, this the bearing and the forgiving is the bearing is the socks and the forgiving is the shoes to what we put on our feet. And we walk around just ready and allows us to continue to go forward and help people out because we have shoes that are called forgiveness. And so when we walk around or whenever somebody crosses us, we're so quick to bear with them and we're so quick to forgive them because our socks and shoes are on our feet and it literally gives us a pep in our step that we're able to go forward and bear and forgive each other because that is in our nature now. It is part of our wardrobe. It is the very clothes and fashion to which we wear on a day-to-day -day basis and is tailored by a person named Jesus. He is our tailor now. 
He's the one that goes and shops for uh, clothes for us. He's our daddy that buys his clothes and gives it to us and says, listen, papi, mommy, listen, put this on. What is this, God? What, what is this stuff? Oh, man, this is compassion. What? Okay. Hey, you put it on. Okay, this is kindness. And this is this. And, this, and it's giving us all these things, gentleness and, and forgiveness and patience and, and all these other things. He said, listen, wear this every day. And you'll be able to continue to go forward and straight. But take one of these things off and you just leave room for the enemy to put something on. You see, the enemy's looking for people and trying to see, okay, whoop, found one. Oh, yeah, they're dealing with some stuff, yeah. Oh they, oh, they don't have the jacket on. Oh, wait a minute. Hey, oh, yo. Yep. Yeah, that jacket right there? Yeah, let me get that. Put that on this dude right here. Yeah, put him up. Put it on him. And then all of a sudden, because we had a jacket missing, we had a piece of the wardrobe missing, the enemy looks for a weak area within our lives, and he says, okay, put unforgiveness on her. Oh, they don't have the, they don't have socks to bear with, with each other or shoes to forgive each other. Hey, we got some drawers for them right here. You got them drawers yet? Yeah, let me get that. Black and red? Yep, let me get that. Put it on him right here. And all of a sudden, man, we're walking around and we ain't forgiving anybody. We're forgetting to bear with each other because we have left something at home and did not put it on us on a day-to-day -day basis. When we get out of bed, we have to make a conscious decision to say this, listen, to say, I will put on compassion. I will put on kindness. I will put on the pants of gentleness. I will bear with each other and forgive each other, put my socks and my shoes on every single day. And then lastly, the Bible says this, love. And over verse 14 and over all these virtues, somebody say virtues. Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. See, that would be the belt right there. I can have this whole outfit on, but if I don't have this belt on, guess what? The shirt ain't intact. My pants start falling or whatever. Shirt coming out and stuff like that. I'm all messed up. I can't run. I can't do anything. I need a belt. This belt right here is the belt called love. It's one that God made for us. And over all these virtues, put on, somebody say it, love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Without love, none of this stuff works. Without love, you will not continue to be gentle. Without love, you will not continue to be kind. Without love, you will not continue to be any of these things. Bearing, forgiving, patient, none of these things without love. Number seven, love is the agape love. It is a God-like love. Love is the very action that binds all of the virtues together in perfect unity. It is love. And so part of this whole ensemble, we need love. Amen. If y'all could stand up. I thought it awesome, man, to go on ahead and put the love chapter in here just to remind us of how we must love. Amen. How we're called to love. If I can get the uh, this music on over here, however you guys are doing this. Listen, you guys are real familiar with this stuff. Some of y'all probably use it at your wedding. When you got married. Thank you, brother. But I want us to remind us of what real love is. Because if love is the very thing that binds them all together in perfect unity, then we need to be reminded about love so that we can go forward in the very ensemble that God has given to us and tailored just for us. 1 Corinthians 13 says, if I, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there is prophecies, there will cease. 
When there are when there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in the part of what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And listen, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. A Christ-centered life is a life that wears the clothes tailored by our Lord Jesus Christ in which we put on daily and wear as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved by God. You all can pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we thank you, Lord God, that you didn't leave us naked, God. You didn't leave us to our own devices, God. Lord, you said put to death these things and put off these other things. And then you said put on these things, God. Lord, forgive us, Lord God, for not putting on the clothes in which you have for us to put on, God. And instead, we began to wear the clothes that represented our old life. When in reality, Lord God, we have been made new in our new self, in a new way of living according to your image and likeness. And God, because of that, we reflected you wrongfully, God. We show the world as Christians something opposite of what you wore and what you, you gave us to wear, God. But Lord, we ask that you would forgive us, God, and help us to put on these clothes, Lord God, by the power of your spirit, God. To put on, Lord God, compassion. To put on kindness. To put on gentleness. To put on patience, Lord God. To put on bearing and forgiving one another, God. And lastly, to put on love that keeps it all together, God. That in everything, we would do it in the love of God. God, we ask that you would have your way. In the name of Jesus, Lord.